Hello again, students. Back for a shorter lecture on our work in week seven on the ninth command, you shall not bear false witness. Let's hop right in. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor is how it's stated in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16. And it's important to understand the language. The word in Hebrew is shakur, meaning deception, disappointment, or falsehood. What's stated here has to do with uh, a court setting. It says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, but also in 23 of Exodus verse 7 and in Deuteronomy 19 beginning in verse 16, as I've said, it's the picture of a courtroom. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but here's the embedded principle in the ninth command. The principle is lying is wrong. In other words, do not perjure oneself in court and don't lie anywhere else either. The Hebrew word kadzav means a lie or untruth, falsehood or deceptive thing. And it's one of the characteristics, the attributes of God. He is the essence of truth. He reveals truth. He speaks truth. And so Moses was told by God to tell the people of Israel, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. And so once again, we are made in his image and therefore we are to think truth and speak truth just the way he does. In the Greek language, the word pseudos means an untruth or a conscious and intentional falsehood. Jesus pointed this out in a very frank and bold way as he spoke to in response to the some of the religious leaders uh, of his day, uh, the leaders in the temple. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Wow, that's in your face preaching, right? He, that is Satan, the evil one, the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. We use the word pseudo as a prefix a lot of times to talk about something that's fake, right? For example, pseudoscience, right? It's not based on objective research, but on... Um, uh, fabrications, preferences, and uh, subjective thoughts, sometimes hidden agendas. So the difference between truth and falsehood is what's being established in this Greek word pseudos here. There are different types of lying. There is uh, the category known as outright lies. We're just not telling the truth. There is deception that is leaving the wrong impression right? There's rationalization. In other words, it's not true, but I've got a good reason for not telling the truth. There's lying by omission. I don't tell everything. There's lying by exaggeration, right? Just, just uh, uh, that uh, stretching of the truth um, for whatever purposes, usually emotional ones. Um, there's plagiarism, the use of another's work in writing or in speech that does not belong to one and has not been properly attributed to the author. There's perjury, right? Um, there's misrepresentation. There's distortion. There's all kinds of ways for us to lie. But the principle is taught by Jesus. We're really talking about trust here. We're talking about the reliability of our character. Can we be trusted with our words? Can we be trusted to tell the truth, to possess and share the truth? Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So we think we know, I think we know what we mean by these little and big lies, or we've called them white lies, right? Those things that mean no harm or that we had a reason for not telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth, 
right? Uh, we can justify them to ourselves, but we need, we need to see the distinction here. Whether little or big, they're all distortions of truth, and we're called to be truth tellers. Now, let's clarify what lying is not. Lying is not use of the literary device in language known as hyperbole. Um, it's an illustration. If you're right, I offend you, cut it off and cast it out from you. We talked about this in our last lecture. Uh, Jesus was, was speaking in a hyper, hyperbolic manner. He didn't mean literally, right? Or lying is not unintentional accuracy. If we say something we believe to be true, although it's not accurate, that doesn't mean that we're telling a lie. Now, it does mean that we're responsible for correcting untruths where we can, if held or told, but an unintentional inaccuracy is not a lie. We thought we were right. We thought we held truth. Lying also is not using irony. It's another literary device or language device. Saying something different than what you really mean, sometimes sarcastically. Oh, I'm just so glad that on my one day off, it's pouring outside and my dog is sick. No, we're not glad. We're using irony, right? And silence is not lying. Sometimes Jesus before his accusers was not silent, but at other times, silence can be a form of lying if we're concealing part of the truth. So it's an important distinction we need to make. Here's a question. Can one lie in his or her actions? In other words, is lying limited to just words? Well, on the one hand, no action is itself a lie. Wayne Grudem points this out in his book, in his chapter. Uh, but on the other hand, if you tell someone you're going to fill up your car with gas, but instead you spend much of the money allocated for the fill up on ice cream at the Dairy Queen, uh, you betray your verbal commitment. You see, this is deception in conduct. So there are times when our actions can belie us, right? Uh, the, the actions can lie, particularly based upon what we've already stated. Why is lying evil? Why must we not bear false witness against our neighbor? And generally, why must we not lie? Well, first of all, as we've already mentioned, lying breaches trust, which is the foundation of all relationships, personal trust, legal trust, commercial, and so on. Uh, it breaches trust. And second, we might not think about it like this, but lying shows contempt by one person or group to another. If we intentionally withhold information from others, it could well be because we don't respect them enough to share full truth with them and nothing but the truth. Now, there can be some underlying causes for that. We might be afraid that there are consequences if we speak truth. Sometimes that might be so, but many times we just don't want to be in trouble. We don't want to be seen as anything different than how we want to be seen. We don't want to be seen for who we are in a moment of weakness or imperfection. And so we're tempted and often do lie. But we need to consider whether or not we're showing true regard and respect for others when we lie to them. Lying it's a means of intentional corruption. Bearing false witness can cause great damage to those being lied about and those affected by the lie, particularly in court. If we know that we're not telling the truth, lives are at stake, property is at stake, the law is involved. Most importantly, though, lying is an affront to God, who is the essence of truth and who cannot but be truthful in all that he says and does. And so it's the part of the moral law that we must live by. It's one of the ought nots. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie. God is true. What he says about reality is accurate and trustworthy. Jesus prayed for his disciples, set them apart in your truth. Your word is truth. 
every word of God is proven true according to the Proverbs. God never lies according to Paul when he writes to Titus. God's truth is immutable. That means it does not and it cannot change. The psalmist point this, points this out. God's truth provides the pathway of life. If God were not true, we would not know what truth is. And we would be hopelessly wandering around in untruth or grasping for reality. And so we need God to be true. And gratefully, he is true. And so therefore, we need to be truth keepers and truth tellers. If God is truth, then we should be like him. Paul tells us that we are conformed to the image of his son, so we should be like Christ. We should be imitators of God, Paul said. And therefore, whoever says that we live in him should walk in the way that he walked, the Apostle John says. Our prayer should be that we ask God to make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truths and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For I wait all the day long. For you, I wait all the day long. We live in what can be called a crisis of deception. Douglas Gruthrus, in his book, Truth Decay, put it this way. Truth decay, and it's a, a phrase that he developed, is a cultural condition in which the very idea of absolute, objective, and universal truth is considered implausible. In other words, we've reached a place of relativism where there is no absolute truth. And those who believe and assert that there is absolute truth are held in contempt, as is the truth that they, they contend for or reveal, or it's not seriously considered. The reasons, he says, for truth decay are both philosophical and sociological, rooted in the intellectual world of ideas as well as the cultural world of everyday experience. These two worlds reinforce one another. In other words, we live in a fallen culture in which institutionally, relationally, systemically, lying and not valuing truth has become the norm. It's the decay of truth or truth decay, as he puts it. Forbes magazine, in a several years old survey, stated that lies in the workplace, just one example, lies in the workplace are expensive. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, a typical organization loses 5% of its revenue to fraud, a potential global loss, global loss of $5 trillion. Ooh. I like how the 19th century British preacher Charles Spurgeon once stated it. He said, a lie will go around the world while truth is pulling on its boots. Wow. Why is it that falsehood is so prized? Because we live in a fallen world. We need to prize truth. Well, what do we do about them? Is it ever right to lie? Um, Aquinas, and you're reading this this week, asserts what can be referred to as absolutism. He states that it's clear after the problem has been thoroughly examined that the Holy Scriptures tell us never to lie, since there are no examples of lies worthy of invitation found in the Bible. You see, the end never justifies the means. To lie is to deny the reality of one's eternity and place one's physical well-being before his or her spiritual well-being. And so uh, Aquinas is going to argue there's never a time to lie. But then again, and we're reading this this week, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian and Lutheran minister in the 1930s and 40s, in particular in Germany, was writing when he wrote uh, an argument for Christian lying during the duress of Nazi Germany and was attempting to think through how, as a Christian, one could justify lying. Here's what Bonhoeffer did. He acknowledged the lying was morally wrong, but he was driven by the need to defy the Hitler regime because they were putting uh, people, particularly the Jewish race, in great peril. It was atrocious and a gross violation of the sixth uh, command 
to not murder. So Bonhoeffer had been very influenced by the Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who was a sort of a pro-existentialist, uh, existentialist, and here's what he said. Live now in the moment and focus on a relationship with Christ instead of following moral guidelines his word is set. So here's what Mar uh, Bonhoeffer reasoned. He did not believe that we could sin with abandon. He called for an acknowledgement of wrongdoing before God. However, Bonhoeffer argued that we must, while accepting guilt for our sins, take responsible action. Using the concrete example, not to lie about hiding Jews, would be what he referred to as a pious indolence, a cowardly act in which one's justi one justifies his failure to protect the innocent and to participate passively in their murder by citing the ninth command. In other words, here's what Bonhoeffer argued. There are times when the greater good, what we might refer to as a perfect duty, must prevail. And the perfect duty, he would argue in this example, would be to protect life. Do not murder. And therefore, do not be a participant in those who will, with those who will murder. And so therefore, he argued that taking responsible action would be to lie if necessary, for example, about the location of Jewish people, individuals, or families or leaders of the Jewish people who were in hiding. Because the extermination of, of Jewish people, it was already underway. Uh, the death chambers were already active, and it was well known. And so it was more than existential. It's not theoretical. It's, it's, it's what could be discussed and needed to be done in the moment of decision-making, uh, Bonhoeffer argued. So in his book, ethics, he says, a Christian with a responsible conscience must bear the guilt for the sake of the neighbor. In other words, there is guilt involved in bearing false witness, lying, right? But it's for a greater good. Now, we can debate that. We can argue that. We can counter-argue that. Um, what is at stake here, I think, and the difference that we need to make or the distinction we need to make is the theoretical, the abstract versus the context. In the theoretical, in the abstractions of life referred to earlier by Kierkegaard and also uh, Bonhoeffer, moral teachings being given without a living actual context. The ethical is reduced to a static basic formula which forcibly detaches man from the historicity of his existence. In other words, there's no context. We can theorize all day long, but when we're in a position of action and someone's life, ours or someone else's, is at stake, we have to make a decision. Shall we lie or not? Put another way, this argument contends the command not to lie is not just a matter for personal conduct, but must be addressed in the context of one's context of in life, political, social, national, our own lives and the protection of others. We want to note Bonhoeffer does not discount the need for moral integrity and recognizes that lying is a sin. He admits that lying is a defection from Christ, which incurs guilt. And so it's not as though all of a sudden, if we lie for a good cause, that the lie is no longer a lie. We didn't tell the truth. We did lie. We did deceive. We did not tell the whole truth, which is a form of lying. We left the long, wrong impression, which is a form of lying, right? So there is a violation of the ninth command, and we need to own it, is what Bonhoeffer is arguing. Um, there must be an extreme situation. The example, Jews about to be seized to be sent to a concentration camp. A necessary, quote unquote, necessary lie is evidence, though, of our fallen condition. Were we not living in a sinful world, lying would never even be considered, right? Wouldn't be needed. 
And even if one takes responsibility for disobeying the command not to lie, he is still guilty for his violating God's law. Ends do not justify means. Sin does not become not sin. Falsehood does not become truth simply because we spoke it for a necessary or perfect law, we might put, we put it, uh, reason. So we see the difference there, right, between Augustine and Aquinas with respect to absolutism. And we might consider what alternatives to lying might exist in such a circumstance, rare as it might be, contextual as it might be. One alternative would be to simply assert, I'm not going to participate in your search. I'm not going to tell you anything because I know what you're planning to do with whatever information you may be given. Now, with that comes other outcomes possibly, right? Greater duress, greater physical and emotional uh, punishment may come. Torture may develop to, to get information right, um, to suborn truth, as we might put it. But uh, that's one alternative. Another alternative might be to just be silent, to not speak a thing. Now, on the one hand, not speaking does not reveal truth. But on the other hand, not speaking, silence might imply that we know something that we're not willing to state. And so therefore, that's going to bring harsher, more severe consequences, possibly or likely as well. Now, the possibilities might exist that if we asserted ourselves and after a period of, of duress, physical punishment or torture, we didn't uh, give up the information, they might move on. Or in not wanting to waste time, they move on. But there's a price to be paid here. Either way we go, right? So we need to understand in such extreme rare conditions, the outcomes uh, of alternative that, that might exist. Well, that brings us to our group dialogue assignment this week. Nothing nearly as dire and severe in our scenario that we're presented with this week. Actually, we're given a rather absurd scenario uh, to look at concerning the perfect and imperfect duties uh, in this case that we're looking at of ourselves being an attorney representing an individual who has left an obscene amount of money to their family pet upon their death. That's what they've stipulated in their will. And would it be morally right to change the will so that the money can go to a more legitimate source? Now, I stated this earlier a couple of times, but I want to state it again. As we write this week, don't feel a need to be as formal. If you put in your citations at the end of your posts, that's all well and good if you document your sources that way. But if you just put in inline references to some of our sources, we've already talked about perfect and imperfect duties. We've already talked about um, um, justice in this manner, moral law, natural law. Don't feel a need to go back and redefine them all again. But Please note what I've highlighted here in red. Please demonstrate uh, those concepts in your response. Demonstrate them in your response. Talk about why justice needs to prevail here, what perfect and imperfect duties are and how they apply, what natural and moral law is and how they integrate into your response. Don't need to be so formal in citing things, but uh, uh, at the same time, uh, be sure to include those, those markers, and there are the other details you have them. Hopefully, this has been helpful to you in our week seven work as well. Once again, we're nearing the end. I thank you for your great participation. God bless you as we continue our work this week.